session on so endometriosis as we all know is a common gynecological condition affecting estimated 160 million women worldwide so the name of the, this condition comes from the word endometrium which is the tissue that lines the uterus so women with endometriosis develop tissue that looks like and acts like the endometrial tissue outside the uterus and it can be present anywhere in the body so each month this misplaced tissue which which looks like and acts like the endometrial tissue responds to the hormonal changes of the menstrual cycle and it creates some bleeding inside the pelvis and wherever it is present this in turn leads to inflammation swelling scarring of the normal tissue surrounding the endometrial tissue so this can lead to adhesions and a terrible kind of inflammation so endometriosis is a far reaching disease that can affect not just your reproductive organs but a lot of but actually the entire body so this is a complex disease and it leaves the patient completely lost so that's where the role of patient advocate comes into picture so a patient advocate does the job of helping their patient receive the best healthcare possible at uh, at the most affordable rates patient advocates don't provide medical advice on their own although sometimes nurses and physicians do act as patient advocates also they actually help you get the right advice from the medical practitioners and understand it and then they manage the recommended care patient advocates serves as a go between for the patient and the family for the patient their family members and the representative from the healthcare industry and today we have one such amazing patient advocate kate so hi hi kate welcome to endo crusaders thank you so kate like many individuals with endometriosis spent around 10 years searching for her di diagnosis In 2018 she started Endo Girls blog with her friend Laura and in July 2020 she became a board certified patient advocate. She continues to professionally advocate for individuals with endometriosis while working as a consultant a consulting chemist. Kate that's impressive. I I really don't know how you find so much time to juggle between jobs, you know. So Kate can you just tell us a little about your story? Yes, absolutely. So thank you for the introduction. My story, I like to honestly start it with being, you know, it's so much like everyone else's endometriosis story. I I started exhibiting symptoms at a very young age. Um I know some people don't experience it until later, but mine were actually prior to menstruation, a lot of bowel symptoms. Um and then I went through, you know, the the motion of misdiagnosis, misunderstanding and dismissal of symptoms. Um by the time I was in my late teens early 20s I had tried various forms of hormonal suppression um because most of my symptoms were just being attributed to my period only and finally after one especially difficult bout of um pain I ended up in the emergency room where you know I had all the typical scans and the tests done and everything came back normal um but you know it was concerning because they had a really difficult time getting my pain under control and it just subsided almost out of nowhere after a couple hours i was fine and it was confusing so i was discharged and told to follow up with my obgyn um my obgyn at the time had just moved she's who i had trusted and i was referred to another gentleman in the office he went over my emergency room notes and told me that i simply just had a painful bowel movement episode that happened to correlate with having my period and that there was nothing actually wrong with me and i could either take a stronger form of hormonal suppression like a lupron or any other gnrh agonist or take more miralax or linzest to keep my bowels moving more properly and i wasn't happy with those answers i was still confused and i was crying and he said if i would not accept those options he would no longer treat me and he walked out and left the door open 
And that's what supercharged me into getting these answers. So fortunately, I was able to find a doctor who believed me, said it wasn't normal. And I was able to have a diagnostic laparoscopy. I just had a simple um, cauterization of the lesions that they found, but my symptoms did not resolve. After Cinerva endometriosis care, where I did have um, excision on my endometriosis and I did have a hysterectomy for my adenomyosis. That was about four years ago. And um, I've been, I like, you know, I haven't had any of those endometriosis symptoms or that pain since. So here I am able to advocate for others. That's, that's amazing. The work that you're doing is absolutely mind blowing. Trust me, we need more people like you doing work, you know? So, uh, okay, tell us we, a little about- We need people yeah. like both of you. <laughs> So tell us a little about how did endometriosis, when it was there, when it was present, how did this, it affect your life? Um, it, it affected my, at first affected my social life with my friends. You know, I was, I was a young girl and I wanted to do things my friends were doing and gymnastics and different sports, but I was always just kind of, I never felt good, right? Like I was just all kind of that a Debbie Downer friend that never felt good enough to go do things. And, um, I was always very self-conscious because of that as well. So it really, it kind of got me in my head a lot about not being good enough or equal or worthy with my friends. And I actually, when I was in the worst of my pain and I couldn't get answers, um, I actually turned to drinking alcohol for my relief. And I, you know, I drank because it made me feel like I fit in. I drank because it made me feel like I, I couldn't, it numbed the pain. Granted, the pain always came back with a vengeance. Um, the alcohol always made it worse, but it affected my life in that I did become an alcoholic and I had to go into recovery. And um, it just inhibited a lot of what I wanted to do in life. You know, it made school extraordinarily difficult. Um, and I think most people can probably relate to a lot of this in the endometriosis community, but I do my best now to use those experiences and use how I felt to be empathetic and help patients know that there is life on the other side. Um, I live a wonderful life now. And, and so I want to help others know that it is a possibility with endometriosis. That's so beautiful, but trust me, it is, I can completely understand how it is for a teenager to go through all the kinds of pain and trying to fit in with your peers, you know, with your with your friends, with you know, just just to be normal, you know, not yeah. anything else, just to be normal, just to be doing what other teenagers are doing, you know. So it, yeah. it gets terribly difficult, and when diagnosis doesn't happen, it really affects you mentally, mm -hmm. you know. So I, I think it takes. It, it once the diagnosis happens i think the earlier the diagnosis happens the better it is for the mental health of the person going through it yeah. absolutely so uh Vimy, you have been seeing a lot of cases with endometriosis so today uh what we want to know is about end uh, abdominal wall endometriosis so how common is it what are the symptoms that a person should look for how is it diagnosed and what is the treatment uh, sure. Before going to that, uh, Kate, uh, I think everyone who ever comes to our uh, platform, they have the almost the same story, the delay in diagnosis, invalidation, misdiagnosis, but glad you guys are coming out of it and helping others. Really happy for all of you. And uh, we usually uh, discuss a topic. We have already discussed bowel endometriosis, bladder endometriosis. I think everything we have covered and abdominal wall endometriosis is the one which we are going to discuss now. I'll share my screen, Shilpa. Yeah. Some surgical images are there, just a little warning for our audience. So basically abdominal wall endometriosis is endometriosis in the abdominal wall, in the layers of abdominal wall. We have seven layers in the abdomen, all of us know from skin to peritoneum. So it can be primary or secondary. The primary abdominal wall endometriosis means there is no cause for it. Like there was no previous surgery happened. There was no uh, event leading to it. 
and the secondary abdominal uh, wall endometriosis is it happens after any surgical event and the most common is cesarean section and abdominal wall endometriosis is increasing in incidence because of the increased cesarean section rate as well and not only cesarean it is also reported after hysterotomy hysterectomy laparoscopies and these surgery may not have been done for endometriosis so scar endometriosis can happen even if the surgery was done for fibroids so any preceding event like a patient had a endometriosis a patient had a laparoscopic surgery for fibroids she may develop endometriosis at her scars from where we give the surgical incision so that is what is called as secondary abdominal wall endometriosis now primary umbilical endometriosis you can see this umbilicus is, has become black and little bigger this is the most common form of cutaneous endometriosis and the incidence is reported to be 0.5 to 1% of all extra genital endometriosis now uh, we usually in common terms we divide into pelvic endometriosis and extra pelvic endometriosis and this is one of the extra pelvic endometriosis there are various theories uh, for endometriosis the cutaneous endometriosis is explained by lymphatic spread and it is also called as villers umbilical nodule because it was first described by now this is the umbilicus removed for this patient the complete excision is the answer for uh, umbilical endometriosis and most of these cases like almost 81% of the cases will not have any evidence of pelvic endometriosis it's only umbilical endometriosis there are various risk factors for abdominal wall endometriosis previous surgeries previous laparotomy or laparoscopic surgeries high parity hysterectomy increased menstrual flow cesarean scar is the most common of the abdominal wall endometriosis because of increase in cesarean section rates the reported incidence is 0.2 to 0.8% and typically in women of childbearing age from 21 to 47 and mean age of presentation is around 32 years the presenting symptoms painful palpable mass can be there this mass becomes more painful there during their menstruation that is called as cyclical pain but it becomes chronic and continuous pain over the time because when the mass size increases it puts pressure on the nerves and the aponeurosis the muscle aponeurosis and the rectus sheath gets stretched out and they'll have a complete abdominal pain that's the reason it gets misdiagnosed again the lump is at the cesarean scar the patient is complaining of a diffuse abdominal pain so they say it is not because of that the lump is here why will you have a diffuse abdominal pain it's really uh, like here also the delay in diagnosis happens because of the lump there is a compression of the nerves and the aponeurosis and the rectus sheath and it causes diffuse abdominal wall pain and the patient does not understand even she is being she is also mis uh, dismissed by the doctors there may not be any symptom at all they may have just a lump but no other symptom and they may not even recognize sometimes and as uh, endometriosis is misdiagnosed as ibs and many other things this is also misdiagnosed as hematoma desmoid tumor incisional hernia injection granuloma keloid and suture granulomas and so on the list is never ending now what is the pathophysiology uh, basically they say there is a direct implantation of the endometrial tissue during the cesarean section the endometrial tissue is inoculated directly at the ends of the cesarean scar which may lead to the development of this tissue because of the blood supply hormonal stimulus and the nutrients the coelomic metaplasia theory and the lymphatic or hematogenic dissemination theory supports it and the reported incidence is 0.03 to 0.45% now how do we diagnose it diagnosis is very simple the clinical suspicion the examination and then the imaging a good sonologist with a high resolution ultrasound can diagnose it very well and the sensitivity is 92% so usually what we do is we diagnose it and we map the lesion and also we understand whether how much excision and whether really she will need a mesh repair or not so a good high resolution ultrasound is enough to diagnose a scar endometriosis until unless it's a very small in size some are the size may range from p size to uh maximum of 9 to 10 cm also has been reported ct there may be a slight hyperretination of the rectus abdominis muscle or a solid well circumscribed subcutaneous mass can be seen ct is most helpful in excluding alternative diagnosis and determining the extent of abdominal wall mass mri 
has a better contrast resolution than CCT and ultrasound. So if there is a small lesions, MRI is a better modality, but most of these can be picked up on ultrasound. So these are the histopathological features where we found again the glands and the stroma, which is consistent with the endometriotic tissue. Complete surgical excision is the treatment of choice for symptomatic patients. And typically it results in complete resolution of symptoms. Now, depending on the amount that needs to be resected, whether the patient needs a mesh repair or not. Many a times patients have heard that all the scar endometriosis excision need mesh repair. So it's not like that. It depends on the extent of sheath involvement and the gap between the two layers. So if the approximation is not adequate after the excision, then mesh repair may be required. This is, we do this we do to prevent hernias and to avoid unnecessary strain on the suture line. And reference is likely if there is incomplete surgical excision or rupture and careful manipulation is required during any surgery that exposes the endometrial tissue. So we have to do actually wide excision with clear margins. In cases of incomplete excision, the recurrence can be as high as 28%. This is our series of uh, scar endo. Now, how can we prevent this scar endometriosis during cesarean is we usually tell that we should carefully flush and irrigate before closure, use separate needles for uterine and abdominal closure, do not use a sponge to clean the endometrial cavity following complete delivery, extending the breastfeeding to delay menstruation, but this is again without any scientific corroboration and using a wound guard. So this is what we have proposed that using a wound guard during cesarean might help, but we really need a long-term study to understand whether really it will prevent scar endometriosis or not. Uh, if we use the wound guard, the inoculation of that endometrial tissue will not happen at the wound margins, but then we need to study it and take a call on that. And uh, if anyone has questions, they can keep their questions in the comment box and at the end of the session, we'll be happy to answer them. Perfect. That was like a brilliant presentation uh, with me as always. Uh, got to know about en abdominal endometriosis, one topic which we hadn't covered earlier. So, uh, so now let's come back to Kate. So Kate, uh, generally a simple question, why did you become a patient advocate? I got so exhausted watching the process of a patient suffering, being in pain, being confused, and trying to navigate the healthcare system at the same time. It's just too much for one person's plate. And I said to myself, there's got to be a way to help somebody in this situation, somebody in this position. There's just too much. And I can only speak on behalf of the American healthcare system, but when it comes to our insurance and navigating our doctors, it's a very disconnected system. And there's not really any great communication from you know, primaries to specialists. And I was seeing there's so many gaps in patient care that, you know, I, I reached out to, you know, my, my biggest, um, the, the advocate I look up to the most, I, I reached out to her and I started, you know, asking questions. And so I found the um, board certification process for being a patient advocate. And I decided to pursue that. Amazing. Amazing. So we don't have the concept of patient advocacy in India as yet. So if somebody wants to become a board certified, uh, you know, patient advocate, what does one have to do? So I'm only aware of a board certification in the United States. Um, there's only one institution that does it. So it is the um, Patient Advocate Certification Board, PACB. Mm -hmm. They have a, an exam that you take, you sit for the board certification. You also have to apply. So there are some um, educational and experience requirements because patient advocacy, when you get board certified, you know, you have to remember it's not just for endometriosis, right? It's a general certification. So you have to understand the healthcare system and what it truly means to be a patient advocate. I kind of went in gung ho, like, all right, I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna fight and I'm gonna help everybody get the right treatment. And then I, I get certified and I'm studying and I'm learning about it. And I realize that it's really about guiding the patient and walking alongside the patient rather than me forcing what I believe is what the patient needs, because I'm not the doctor. 
Um, I'm not the patient. And it's all about that informed consent, right? Someone who can sit down and break the information down for the patient. These are the medication options you've been given. Let's go through those together. What looks like a good option for you? Um, most and oftentimes patients don't get the opportunity to give a true informed consent because you know a doctor will tell them, well, these are the likely the side effects you're going to get. We said, you know, I think this is a good drug for you. Well, there's a lot more to it. And I know in the United States, at least I like patients to be able to read the entire FDA approval packet for a, a medication so that they can see all of the detailed information about it. Um, and same with surgery, you know, we go through the credentials of the surgeon, we look at patient feedback. It's honestly about getting as much information about, you know, their treatment options as possible and sitting down with them and helping them guide, helping guide them through that process. And it becomes extraordinarily rewarding when you see a patient become empowered and make those decisions for themselves and come out on the other end of it. Um, there are setbacks. There are times where I'm upset with what a patient has chosen, but that is not my role. So there's been a lot of personal growth in being a patient advocate. For individuals outside of the United States where there is not a certification already set in place, I highly, highly, highly encourage those individuals to start working with other healthcare professionals to design a board certification. So our board in the United States is made up of, you know, we have physicians and we have researchers and other experts in the field. So I think it's extraordinarily important for individuals to collaborate and get together and look at what it takes to create your own board certification. Completely makes sense. It's, it's something like having a support system for the patient mm -hmm. to make the patient understand what the patient is actually going through or would be going through, you know, so that the patient can make a right decision. I mean, at the end of it is the patient's decision. Yes. But saying that a patient advocate is the right person who can guide the patient through the entire process. Mm -hmm. So, Kate, what and does it take? Uh, so, do you work with a particular physician and how it works? So, what happens is that I actually set up my own business, right? So, I have what's called a limited liability corporation. And I've got a contract. I've got... Um, insurance that's specific to having a patient advocate business. And so I will do like a consultation with a patient that's struggling. And then we'll go through whether or not that I'm a good candidate to help them. Another role of a patient advocate is referring a patient to another advocate who is more specialized in a specific field. So maybe they're having an insurance issue that I'm not specialized in helping them with. I will refer them to another advocate who's better at that. So we go through the contract, we go, you know, we make the agreements and we say, we decide I'm a good fit for them. I will do whatever I will do. You know, I can do almost any kind of communication for that patient. So I can go to the doctor's office visits. I can be in communication with that doctor. I get um, like a HIPAA release form to be a point of contact. I can have access to their medical records. I will talk with their physicians. I will meet with their doctors to make sure that everybody's on the same page. My goal is really to step in and do all of that complicated work so the patient can just relax and focus on getting well. So are there different kinds of patient advocates? Yes, there are. There are a variety. And I know that we have websites that you can go on to and you can you go to search for an advocate. So for varying different um, health conditions, or situations, maybe you're in a legal battle with insurance in the United States, there's advocates for that in healthcare. So we are, there's quite a wide variety and I do like how it's a very open system of us referring patients to who's the best suited candidate. I think that that is um, one thing I really appreciate it because it's putting the people over profit. Good. That's nice. So that makes complete sense. So what does it, uh, what makes a good patient advocate? What skills do you need as an advocate? Um, first and foremost, I think a personal experience, especially when it comes to endometriosis, I think is critical. Um, I know that there are other um, realms of advocacy where you don't necessarily have to be an experienced patient, but with endometriosis, I think it's, it's critical. I think um, a patient advocate needs to be able to speak their truth they need to be able to speak up for injustice. They need to speak up for the individuals who are being taken advantage of. 
It requires a level of confidence that I hadn't experienced for myself. Um, and it, it requires, you know, dedication to learning. We have to do continuing education. So we have to continue to, you know, learn policy, learn laws and learn personal development on how to best represent another individual who may be suffering. So those are, you know, the qualities, I guess, black and white, you know, somebody who's been there, done the patient, you know, able to go through the training, take the exam, and then be dedicated to pursuing that continuing education and always standing up for what is right with that patient. And this was hard for me, the ability to be humble and know that what I think is right may not be the best choice for the patient. Absolutely. Uh, I mean, that's, that's completely understandable. It must be like really tough when you know that something that you're saying is right for the patient, but then the patient doesn't take that as the right decision. I, I can it's very it. hard. <laughs> I, I can understand. So how important, how important is it to be an advocate? It's critical. So whether or not you're board certified or not, if you can be your own advocate, it's it it can it's a lot to ask for a patient. But that's what we try to do is educate, um, so that maybe you can't get a patient advocate. You have to do it on your own. We try to provide as much information and empowerment as possible to do it on your own. Or maybe you don't have the time to go be board certified, but you see someone else in your life who really could utilize that help, you know, so educate yourself, do the best you can to find out, you know, the ins and outs of what that patient is going through and really just be there to support and guide them. So there's different, you know, there's different capacities in which you can be an advocate. And I think the most suitable and accessible for most people is to just become as educated on the topic as possible and help guide somebody who else is suffering. Absolutely. That was like brilliant. I mean, honestly, the work that you are doing is like just mind blowing. I mean, I've been, I've just been reading some comments and everyone is like going gaga about you, Kate. <laughs> you should go through the comments later once you're done with the session. <laughs> I'm sure you have a lot of them to read. <laughs> so, I've had to carve out mental, my own mental health is a big part of this component. So I don't want to leave that out. If you decide to be an advocate, you need to have a very strong system in place for your own mental health, because it is very sad to hear some of these stories and to not let that wear me down. I know some ultra empathetic people really struggle with that. So my own mental health has been important, but I've had to carve out time for myself because I will spend all day and all night talking to people. <laughs> Absolutely. I, uh, it's, it's imperative that your mental health has to be like, you have to take care of your mental health because you are always surrounded by so much of pain, so much mm -hmm. of agony, you know, so I think that starts affecting you some way or the other if you don't start taking care of yourself. Absolutely. So any parting words for our viewers? If you, you know, you have this burning desire like I had to help others, just start where you can. You know, just start, you can just Google, you know, patient advocacy. How can I be a patient advocate? Advocate. Start to understand your healthcare system where you live. That is a really big missing component. As soon as you can break down your healthcare system and understand how it works, you can help patients better navigate their own care. Otherwise, you know, so many, so much of the time we're left in the dark. So my departing words there are, you know, get educated, do the research, get empowered the best way you can. I don't care if it takes listening to cheesy inspirational videos on YouTube, which I have done to get me pumped up. You know, if I'm in a dark spot, but you know, get around that positivity and know that your story matters, your experience matters and your pain matters and we can use it to help others. True. Um, Bimi, you want to add on something? I come across so many uh, endometriosis patients and uh, it's the same story. That's the reason we, uh, we are doing these sessions so that we can educate more and more people. And uh, I always tell my patients also that be your own advocate. You have to find the solution. If we can't change the healthcare system in one day, definitely. So if you know the disease, if you know your body, if you know what is right or what is wrong for you, you can choose the best. True. Sure. So, uh, Kate, I think, uh, sorry, I interrupted. There is a question for you. 
Uh, Madhu is asking, um, I can tell you that it's so exhausting to be self-advocate advocate at every time I meet a new doctor or a patient, etc. Any advice? <sighs> That's a tough one. <laughs> It, it may, at that point, it may be worth going to, um, I can find a way to maybe link it for you. There's a National Association of Healthcare Advocates. They have a website where you can search for patient advocates. Um, obviously, you know, someone could always reach out to me and maybe I could find them someone local if that's what they prefer, because it really, I understand. That's, I wish that was an answer that was cut and dry and that I could, you know, I wish I could just like sprinkle some confident dust on that individual and say, you got this, you can do this, but it is, it wears you down. And I wish there was more I could do about that. True. That makes uh, that sense. It's absolutely difficult to stand up for yourself, but sometimes you're left with no choice and you have to do it. You know, when you believe in yourself, I, I think you have to fight for your own sanity you, you know? do the best I can do sometimes is just validate that it is difficult you know sometimes that's all I can do is I can say I get it it's hard and you're you're amazing for pushing through and that we'll get on the other side of this oh completely I've I've done that for more than two decades so I know how it is yeah. <laughs> it can get crazy it can get crazy so it was like a lovely session. So what I have realized from this session is that a patient advocate is someone who can help you reduce the overwhelming feeling that we actually get into when we are diagnosed with something like an endometriosis. So with a patient advocate, uh, you know, you have a person who can keep an eye for the situations that you are not prepared for, you know, mm -hmm. or you, it's not going as planned by you. You know, so that's what I realized. And it's like taking a lot of stress out from the patient and their families, you know, and yes. which is like really, really amazing. This is some concept which a lot of countries have still to adopt. I, I, I really hope that it comes into picture very soon. We are trying to do that. Let's hope how, how much we are able to make a difference. Yes, fingers crossed. <laughs> Rooting for you, always. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. It was like a lovely session that we had. And thanks, Vinny, Thank again for the amazing presentation. And, yeah. and thanks to both of you for all, uh, for what all you are doing in spite of your regular profession. Oh. You are really helping other people coming out of it. It's Thank really you. great. Thank See, you. this is my Thank profession, you. definitely. I am into it and uh, I'm recreating awareness and helping them. It's fine. But you people being in other profession, taking out time for patients and helping them understand the disease and taking decisions, it's really great. Thank you. Well, I would not have the I, profession, I wouldn't have the profession I have today if it weren't, you know, for the advocating and the proper <laughs> treatment. So that's what Arti from Kenya always says, turning pain into power. So yeah, I love that. Doing. that. Absolutely. Aarti is another powerful woman, huh? for sure. She's like an <laughs> amazing warrior. <laughs> she is. Yeah. Thanks to all our viewers who logged in with us live and to everyone who's going to watch a recorded session. Thank you. Thank you for supporting us always. Thanks Thank and have a lovely evening ahead. Bye-bye and take care.